When Ridley Scott first brought the perfect specimen to screen, he introduced the world to H.R. Giger's otherworldly works and designs while setting a new standard for sci-fi horror for the foreseeable future. Sequels have come and gone with mixed receptions, but the concept, creatures, characters, and their mysterious world has always held a tight place next to many of our hearts, our anticipation for a new entry palpable enough to practically burst from our chests. Romulus isn't what I would call the perfect organism and some would call it the equivalent to a big-budget fan film. It takes us back to a tight crew of colony space workers, back to that haunted house setting of the space station's trapping interior, and it follows some familiar beats known to the franchise. Besides a list of nitpicks I do have at the end of the video with some questionable elements that I'll get into later, I think it's one of the better specimens overall, and I'm pretty happy with what we got. Alas, we have a ragtag group of new characters, a crew of young workers who all want off this planet and to escape the colony. Between the varied dramas and personal circumstances for each of them being here, many are thinly defined with their personal baggage being their sole notable trait. That is apart from Rain and Andy. Kaylee Spain, he does a great job of playing Rain and quickly felt welcome to the Hall of Sci-Fi Hero Wines with much potential for more. She brings a stoicness to her characters and a willingness to face the terrors of the unknown. David Johnson did a great job in a capturing performance with Andy, the android who I always took as a stand-in for someone with autism or some sort of difficulties in expressing themselves. Archie Renal plays Tyler, the group leader and organizer of this whole operation. Isabella Merced played Kay. She manages to bumble through a string of perilous situations after another. Spike Fern is Bjorn, the asshole of the group who constantly antagonizes Andy due to a trauma of what happened with his mother in a fatal workplace incident involving another android. Eileen Wu is Navarro, the mostly silent pilot. Her character serves similarly to set dressing for most of the time and is probably the biggest example of thinly defined characters in the movie for me. The likeness of the late Ian Holmes has returned as Rook, a damaged company android stationed on the Romulus, voiced by actor Daniel Bentz with a cold and calculated demeanor. Rook serves as a visual cameo for the very first ever android in the franchise to grace the screens all the way back in 1979. Ridley Scott and Fede Alvarez both felt and agreed that Ash is the one likeness of android who's yet to make a returning appearance like many of the other droids that came after him. Actor Holmes passed away in 2020 and Fede wanted to show the utmost respect when pitching the idea of this and getting blessings from Holmes' widow at his estate, who, by reports, was thrilled with the idea of having him back. Ian Holmes has not signed away his likeness before his passing. Romulus features a mix of practical and visual effects that bring the xenomorphs and facehuggers to life. Apparently, the original special effects group from the original movies came back for this. Director Fede Alvarez had a rule, if it can be practical, it will be practical. I think the music is pretty good. By Benjamin Walfitch, the music goes to three distinct places that I couldn't really focus on when I was watching the movie, so when I thought about it and I had the chance, I listened to the soundtrack by itself. It's got the ominous and spacey orchestral stirrings we've come to know with the alien soundscape. There's definitely some inspired sound, especially in the strings that give hints of cues from the older movies. This takes a further step in the intense moments where the music becomes more distorted and digitized and unpredictable. However, towards the end is where things really take a turn. The orchestral strings now are monstrous, cracking, stretching, and damn near become industrial. The timings feel erratic and awkward in all the best ways. It fits the absolute chilling end sequence of the movie, and it feels like an accumulation of all the places the music had gone up to this point. The music definitely picks up in the latter half, just like the movie. Okay, last thing about music. I have a question to ask you, and I'm not sure how to ask, so I'll just have to show it and see if you see the possible connection. Now, before we continue, I want to take a moment to thank you for being here, and for some of the support, words of encouragement, and critiques given. Some of my previous videos have gone to heights I'd never imagined, and that's incredibly inspiring. 
Honestly, I want to make a special video for you guys for helping me reach past 100 subscribers and giving me so much inspiration. More on that soon. Anyways, without further distraction, let's get back to the- Now I'm gonna try to rapid fire some final points before giving my final score. You can either skip or follow along. These are some of the moments that stood out to me. The anti-gravity scene where Rain uses her pulse rifle to maneuver herself through Zero-G. Andy's rebooting scene was spooky. Tyler shows Rain how to use the pulse rifle, a nice nod to aliens with Hicks and Ripley. On one side of the coin, seeing Rook return was a pleasant shock, even if it was very computer generated for likeness. Seeing the Xenomorph's inner jaw at work, uncut and uncensored, is bleak and eye-opening. I'll see myself out the airlock. I like the opening sequence and its sound design. It's a small detail that I strangely appreciate a lot, as personally I find it can be indicative of the mindset behind the creative decisions to be expected in general. A tiny but crucial start of an introduction. The film opens up with the wreckage of the Nostromo, and within the debris, the alien from the first movie, fossilized. In the 1979 film, Ripley had flown the big chap far away from the Nostromo for some time before harpooning it out of the airlock. The way the alien's discovery plays out seems more of a creative liberty for Romulus. I was also confused as to why the big chap was fossilized. However, I found this wonderful video that goes into some well thought out explanations as to how exactly that could be. Romulus introduces a new twist. The big chap didn't die in space, but instead cocooned itself in a secreted resin, preserving its life until it was recovered by Wayland yutani the cocoon itself is an unexpected development in the Xenomorph life cycle, one that hadn't been previously explored in the film franchise. The crew of miners are able to leave the planet with seemingly no restrictions or real cautions. The colony planet seems strict, yet strangely unaware since they don't even notice their own space station floating over their heads. A space station filled with Weyland yutanis deepest and darkest secrets, mind you. When Navarro falls onto the controls of her ship, she does so in such a way that the ship stylishly drifts near perfectly into the one open port anywhere near on the station and crash lands it without totaling it. This felt like a sequence from a video game. Reintroduced and killed off Big Chap from the first film without any screen time outside of its fossil. You deserved better, Chap. The connection to Prometheus and Covenant feels like a checkbox being marked off. When Andy is riding the Xenomorph down the elevator shaft, he exclaims a famous Ripley line. In test screenings, Fede said that he'd placed that line in specifically to spruce up that section of the movie and kept it in when it got so many reactions. It wasn't for me. The character Rook of all things and effects in this movie is the effect that I think stands out the most, and I don't mean that in a good way. Rook is not a tribute. A tribute is to replicate something or someone's performance and likeness near to a T, and usually of particular works. Think of the Michael Jackson tribute performance in Vegas, or the Linkin Park tribute band. Rook is a creative decision and another line of fan service that Fede taps into from time to time, one that leaves a jarring experience with his CGI face. My face is tired, despite the thought and effort they obviously put into it. I've heard different sides of this argument. Who do you think is paying for the tickets? Why is fan service such a bad thing when the fans are the ones paying for this shit? Well, it can be easily used as a crutch. The technology is getting better for it. Although seeing Rook on screen could make anyone think otherwise. Bringing back past actors with their likenesses has always been a pretty mixed area for me. On one hand, there's times when an actor's passing occurs before their time and before the production or collective work and vision can be completed. These times are usually handled with the utmost care and respect. On the other hand, a slippery slope for many movies to use nostalgia as excuses for quick, cheap fan approval and reactions, like jump scares or a flatulence joke to a child. Overall, I give Romulus a 7 out of 10. It's got some cool ideas, some great visuals, neat scenarios, it's a little heavy on the fan service and there's some questionable elements, but I really like the movie. I don't normally add all of these extra elements to my videos, but given that I've been away for a bit and I'm a fan of the series, I felt like this was a good excuse to talk a little more on it. Thank you guys for watching. If you're an Alien fan, then definitely check this one out. And if anything I've said is appealing to you, give it a shake. It's still one of the top playing movies in theaters at the time of writing this. Do you like the nitpicks and moments sections in my videos? Anything on your mind, leave it down below in the comments. 
Have a good day. Leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.